Okay, so it's a two-part um, technical review session on Winch Assist, which follows on from the overview of Winch Assist, which was really just a background in terms of how the systems have developed and how they've become a mainstream system here uh, in New Zealand, but also in Canada, in South America. And in fact, the place where they're used in the biggest numbers are actually in Europe. Uh, so it's quite a common system and it really is helping us change how we harvest, especially on steep and or difficult slopes. This is the same little video clip that we saw in the overview paper, but it's, you can see the winch assist uh, unit. In this case, it's integrated into the machine as opposed to it being on a, a, a unit uh, mounted at the top of the um, hill. But in this case, the winch is actually integrated into that machine. It's simply pulling on that rope and it's helping pull the system up and helping it lower down the hill to reach places that we would not otherwise be able to get to. So on a good soil with this cable, we're able to get up to 90% or 40 degrees very readily. And what we typically say in New Zealand that 100% or 45 degrees is about the absolute upper limit uh, that we can work on. However, that's an upper limit. And what we're trying to understand within this first session here around the technical aspects is what are some of the other limits or what are some of the lower limits or what are some of the factors that affect the limit where we can operate on. As you will see, and there's a number of these hazard alerts or safety alerts available, is that machines that are tethered can of course tip over, uh, they can of course roll. And that's a risk for the operator. So while they're on a rope, and it's helping them, it certainly doesn't prevent us from having accidents. And so there's clearly risks with winch assist machines that we need to manage. And to be able to manage them, you need to have that technical knowledge around what some of those aspects are. You're listening to a lecture at the moment on this, but there's actually quite a lot of best practice information available already. Okay, you can see some of these publications. Uh, there's one out of Canada, uh, uh, written by FP Innovations, uh, which is called Best Management Practices for Winch Assist. Uh, if you're up in Washington, they've also got a standard practice. Within New Zealand here, we've got some rules within the ACOP, but we also have some companies, namely Rayonair, as well as Hancock's, that have provided documentation the Rayonair one you see in the top right hand corner, they call it safe system of work. And they've also produced fairly significant documents that they share freely around appropriate measures uh, and, and practices for uh, making sure that our winch assist operations are safe on steep slopes. What the ACOP tells us is that we want our machines to be stable. Okay, so the ACOP rules specifically for people who manage forest operations state that our systems must not be compromised. Okay, so how do we compromise a winch assist system? Of course, this is a machine. We see the bottom picture there. This was not on a winch, but it's rolled over. So perhaps one of the questions was what compromised this system and how did it end up flipped over on its side, uh, in this case, over the back? Uh, on a steep slope. The fact that it's on a steep slope is straight away giving this first indication that slope is one of those key factors with regard to how we manage our machines, be they winch assist or non-winch assist uh, in our forest areas. What I did was within the scope of teaching courses on winch assist for industry, I've actually stepped through a lot of literature and looked at what are some of the slope limits that we can find in these different best management practice guides. Looking back at the old ACOP as well as some of the older information, we can see some of these lower limits. Okay, so 30%, 17 degrees for wheeled machines, 40% for track machines. So up to about 10 years ago here in New Zealand, those were in fact some of the upper limits 
for what was acceptable for ground-based operations, but with improved machinery, we've been pushing past those limits for quite some time. Okay? But the bottom line there is that on poor soils, it is easy to start slipping with a wheeled machine. It's easy to lose control with a wheeled machine or a track machine on 40% slopes. So while that is a little bit steep, it's not very steep at all, uh, but it's showing the effect of soils there. What we're suggesting now is that for these advanced systems with experienced operators on reasonable soils, we can actually push 50%. 50% it's steep, it's 27 degrees, but we're actually comfortable operating on those slopes. What we have in New Zealand, there's a lot of slopes elsewhere as well, Canada, South America. We've got a lot of slopes that are steeper than 50%. So the question then is, what are some of the systems that we can effectively operate on those steeper slopes? What we know without winch assist, is that we do have such a thing as an upper limit. So this is without the support of winch assist, an upper limit or a reasonable upper limit is about 70% or 35 degrees. To be able to achieve that upper limit, you need three things. One is a purpose-built steep terrain machine. So you shouldn't be taking a normal excavator up there. You want to be taking a self-leveling machine or some of those wheeled machines specifically designed for operating on steep slopes. That's one factor. The second factor is the soils. We want a strong, stable soil to be operating on. And the third thing is an experienced operator. If one of those aspects is missing, we shouldn't be going over 50%. Okay, so that's simply too steep, but that's an upper limit. When all the factors are right, that's what we can get to without winch assist. We've known for quite some time that it isn't just the slope. So this is one of your um, student colleagues, effectively. Uh, David McLean, already eight years ago, was one of my dissertation students. And he started to step through what are some of the slope limits depending on both the configuration of the base of the machine. Is it going straight up and down the hill? Is it going across the hill? And also, what sort of a payload has it got uh, if it's a fella buncher, if it's picked up, in this case, a two-ton tree, and it's slewed it out to the side, you can see that less than 40% is acceptable, but over 40% in that 50% category, we're in the red zone, so that will tip the machine over. But very quickly, you can see that if we have a fella buncher, and we pick up a three-ton tree all the way off to the side, we can actually start to tip that machine over already at the 20% mark. Conversely, if we've only picked up a one ton tree and hold it out to the side, moving straight up and down the hill, we can actually get up to a 70% slope and still be safe. So you can see how it isn't just the slope, but it's also what we've picked up and the configuration of our excavator, whatever machine we've got out on site. It's not as simple as just slope. So what we know is that from our um, database, from our accident database, that machines rarely fall over on the slope. They don't just tip over because typically the operators being experienced can act to stabilize the machine. So if they start to feel uncomfortable, if they start to feel the machine tipping, they can quickly slew or they can put the bucket down, they can put the tree down and stabilize the machine. So most of the rollover accidents that are caused, that, are, that occur on our steep slopes, are not just tipping over, but they're typically by loss of traction, okay? So what happens is we lose traction, we start to slide, we hit an object, like a stump or a log or a rock, and that will flick the machine over, all right? So that's the most common failure um, reason and hence, that's the thing that we actually need to manage for, okay? We need to stop machines from sliding because once they start to slide, they're very likely to tip over. They're out of control. They're not stable. Okay. So just that rollover aspect, um, if we were inside in a lab, I'd have my little excavator in my hand and I could demonstrate this. Um, but basically, 
everything tips over when the center of gravity extends beyond the last contact point on the ground, okay? So when the center of gravity goes beyond the last contact point, it will tip over. If you'd like some proof of that, what you could do is stand up. Your belly button is about the center of gravity, is your center of gravity, okay? And if you keep your body relatively straight and start to lean to one side, you will actually notice when your belly button goes beyond the point of where your feet is on the ground, you will tip over. You can't stop yourself, okay? It's as simple as that. So the picture on the right there is a forwarder with the boom out to the side. Its center of gravity is a bit higher and to the left because of the boom. And you can see it's gone beyond that last contact point on the ground. So that machine will, at this point of time, tip over. Whereas that excavator center of gravity, typically at the pin of where the boom is attached to the machine, it's still in front of that last contact point. So it's still stable until it gets a little bit steeper. Right. So do try that. If you haven't just done it now, try it after class. Get your belly button, move it across your feet, and you will go over, okay? There's nothing you can do to stop it. But just like us, we move our feet, we twist our body, we do something to stop ourselves from tipping over, and that's what a machine operator does as well, okay? We've known for a long time, so here you see a graphic that we've used in Europe for some time. You can see it's already 25 years old, it, that it isn't just a slope and that reinforces it. So what we've got here is two factors. One is the slope on the left hand. The other one is at the x-axis is the soil bearing capacity. Okay? If you've done the soils class, you'll know what the CBR, so that's California bearing ratio, but basically as that ratio, the percent figure goes up, the stronger the soil you've got, okay? So you can see straight away there at that 3%, which is a very weak soil, you go up and see what's the limit, it's about 30%. So that matches up very nicely with that first slide that we showed, right? When you've got a stronger soil, okay, so say in the middle of the chart somewhere we go up and we hit that 50% mark, okay, and then they say, hey, we're getting up into a critical area. So hopefully now, if you tie these two things together, it's critical. We know we're at a higher risk area when we go over 50%. What do we need to operate in that critical area? Purpose-built machines. You see two little diagrams there. You need that stronger soil, plus you need a, a better operator. The other thing that this graphic illustrates very nicely is that once you get up over um, that limit, it used to be 60%, we've moved it to 70% now. That's simply the better capability of machines. But you can see what's the answer to operating over and above in these very critical areas is to go winch assist. Okay, so that's where winch assist very much fits in to our harvest system selection. Again, this is a colleague of yours, so Hamish Burkett, um, did his masters with me actually. So, and he put a digital um, clinometer on 22 different machines, 18 in New Zealand, and he got to go to Europe and put four on in Europe. Without going into too much detail, he collected a lot of information, but one of the things that, stepped, that stood out, one is that we're nearly always exceeding the limit. Back then the limit was 40%. Every single one of our systems that we measured worked on over 40% slope, which showed that real disconnect between the old rule and what we're actually doing. But the other really interesting thing that came out of his master's work was that on low slopes, the machine is typically on a steeper slope than the slope itself. On steep slopes, as shown by the excavator all the way to the right, when we're on steep slope, the excavator by and large is on a, a lower slope than the terrain, okay? So we got the terrain information from our GIS, from our layers underneath, and we got the machine slope from the digital clinometer. What was happening there was that when machines go on to steeper slopes, the machine operator, because they're experienced, because they're operating on steeper slopes, will actually find bits of the slope that are lower slope, okay? So you wouldn't expect an experienced operator to simply just go straight up the slope 
what they do is find every little bench, every little hollow they can find to get their machine on a better slope or a lower slope than the terrain slope, okay? So we've got proof of that. So now we've not only got slope, we've not only got soil, but we've also got the operator having an effect on the stability of our systems. When do we lose traction? Straight physics here, um, and hopefully something the engineers will have seen before in the class, but this is the basic phys physics of it, okay? You see the little diagram on the right-hand side, there's a machine sitting on the ground. At that point in time, there's two forces. If we ignore the cable for this point, uh, at this time, we've basically got gravity, okay? And gravity is clearly pulling down. That's that blue arrow. And then we've also got a certain traction capability, which is the track sitting on that soil. That's shown by that T, which is a holding force. Here's the bottom line is that if gravity is larger than our traction force, guess what happens? We're sliding, we're off, okay? So when W is greater than T, we start sliding. It's as simple as that. There's nothing an operator can do at that point in time. They're on the move, okay? What I can tell you is gravity is something that's relatively easy to calculate, okay? So gravity is simply the weight of the machine times the sign of the angle that the machine is sitting on. You got a calculator handy? Calculate a piece of paper. If I was to give you this example that if there was a 25 ton machine sitting on a 40 degree slope, okay, 25 ton, 40 degree slope, the sign of 40 degrees, got your calculator there, it should be 0.64. Okay, so we know our gravity factor is 16 tons in that case. Okay. So we know that gravity, so if we've got this 25 ton machine sitting on a 40 degree slope, it's effectively being pulled down by a 16 ton force. That's a big number. That's a really, really big force. Okay, very powerful force pulling on that machine. Now the traction is just that little bit harder. So one there's two aspects to it. One is a thing that's called the normal force, okay? And that normal force, again, if you look across to that diagram, that's that W with the little N, normal force, which is a force of the excavator pushing into the ground. Because we're on a slope, it's not the full weight. If it was flat, all 25 ton would be pushing into the ground. Because it's on an angle, not all 25 ton pushes into it, okay? that normal force is given simply by W times the cos of theta, okay? And again, in this scenario for the 40 degree slope with my 25 ton machine, the cos of 40 degrees is 0 0.76, and what we're left with is 19 ton. So of the 25 ton machine pushing down into the ground, we've only got 19 ton left at a 40 degree angle. And as you can imagine, that increases with decreasing slope and decreases with increasing slope. The other factor that comes into the traction component, so it isn't just the normal force, but it's normal force multiplied by what we call a traction coefficient, okay, that's CTE. So it's a coefficient associated with the traction, and the traction is given by the interaction of whatever it is, wheels or tracks, and the soils. So where do we find that sort of a number around the traction coefficient? First, step back, this is your gravity force, okay? As a chart, you can do the calculation gravity um, uh, factor, so this is the gravity force, so you can do your sine of the angle, or you can look it up on this chart, we were at 40 degrees before, if we go up to 40, we're gonna end up at that 0.64, so 0 0.64 times the machine weight was our 16 ton of gravity, okay? So whether you do the sign calculation or simply look it up on this chart, you go up, so at 30 degrees we'd go up, we'd go across, we'd find ourselves at exactly 0.5. And of course, if we really start to push slope at 45, we'll end up at like a 0 0.7 factor. Steeper you go, the bigger the gravity force. That's nice and logical but this is how you calculate it out. 
with regard to traction efficiency, how do we calculate that or what is traction efficiency? It's actually, uh, I'm able to explain it relatively easily in that if we have a machine and it doesn't matter what machine it is, could be your bicycle, could be your car. In this case, it's a picture of a skitter, but it could be an excavator as well, okay? You could try this at home, sit on your bicycle, apply the brakes and have somebody pull you along, okay? And see what sort of a force they need to pull you. The ratio of your weight, that's you plus the bicycle, um, divided by the force that they needed to pull you, that's your coefficient of traction, okay? So in this case, we've got our pulling force, which is your FTE, the force needed to pull, the skitter with the wheels locked divided by the normal force gives us this traction coefficient. A lot of work, especially by the US Forest Service, has been done on traction coefficients. So we actually already know some numbers. Okay, so what we can see here is for wheeled machines, this traction coefficient can range anywhere from 0.2 to 0.5 is a typical range. So 0.2 is a very low coefficient 0.5 is would be really good on a good soil. We can see our chains 0.4 to 0.7 and straight away that is logical. What can climb up a steeper hill? A skitter with chains on or a skitter without chains? Why do we put chains on skitters? Because it helps them climb better. Why does it help them climb better? Because they end up with a higher traction coefficient. Okay. The best climbing machines under normal conditions are our tracked machines. So you can see they would range from 0.5 all the way up to 0.9. All right, so these are the coefficients. So putting that together, how do we use it? So what we've got on this diagram now here is that blue line is that gravity line, right? Blue line is the gravity line. And these curved lines here are actually your traction coefficients, but it's the force we're able to achieve, which means we need to multiply by that normal force, which is decreasing over time, hence they're curved. Right. What we're able to do now is actually look at um, when these uh, lines come together, that is the point when the machine starts to slide, okay? What we've said before is that a tracked machine on a poor soil would have a traction coefficient of around 0.4, right? That's about as, that's a low number. If we have a look at this 0.4 line and see when it intersects the gravity force line, what's the value we're looking at here? It's about 22 degrees, right? You're seeing that on the chart? What's 22 degrees in percent slope? Do that calculation, but 22 degrees is 40%. Where have we heard that before? Remember on that first chart I showed you was 40% is when a machine can start to slide. So this is really just the physics behind that same point at 40% slope, at 40% traction coefficient, our machines can start to slide because that's when they intersect with gravity. The best you could probably achieve with a track machine is around that one or just below one. So if we look at that one line traction coefficient, where does it hit? Right here. We come down, we come down to 45 degrees, okay? So remember that's what I said should be the absolute upper limit of any type of system because we know that we become, we're at risk there of the machine sliding away if it's not being held up. So all these numbers start to make sense and this is the physics behind it. The good thing here is when we start to add a cable, and I'll show you that, that's that force now. So now all of a sudden we've got our gravity, the blue line still acting down, we've got our traction holding us up, but in addition to the traction, we've also got the force in the cable, all right? So we could see in that previous example, when we've got a weak soil, and we start sliding our machine at 22 degrees, this is what would happen on a weak soil. If we add the cable, which is a force at 25% of the weight of the machine. And we'll step through these calculations a bit later on. But basically, if we add it on, 
So this C is this 25% of the weight. Look where we get to. We end up at 38 degrees. Okay. So by adding winch assist, we've gone from 22 degrees all the way up to 38 degrees in terms of where that machine can safely operate. We know that a lot of our forest land is over 22 degrees, but in fact, there's not much over 38 degrees, right? You guys have been out there in the forest, you've measured some slopes. How many of those numbers were more than 22? Plenty. How many were more than 38 degrees? Not very many. So all of a sudden for your woodlock planning exercise, we were in a terrain where there was a lot of slope around that 30 degree, you can straight away start to see the benefit of having winch assist operating in your area. This is actually a graphic. Uh, one of the things that it specifically says in our ACOP is that we should follow manufacturer guidelines. So here is a manufacturer guideline that is being generated by, in this case, EMS, which is a company up in Rotorua. They make the traction line machine. These numbers here are your traction efficiency, okay? This here is the slope. So if we go to a similar scenario, if we go to a scenario where we've got a 30 degree slope here, and we're on a fairly weak soil, which is that blue line, we can actually see what sort of a force we need in the cable for us to be stable, okay? So this is really a very useful graph that's been produced based on the physics that would allow an operator or yourself as a manager of an operator to actually manage the expectation of what sort of tension force do I need as a minimum to be able to operate on this slope with this type of soil condition, okay, to stay safe. What happens when you're on a rope, but the rope plus your traction isn't as high as your gravity factor. So here's a little video clip from Europe. Turn the sound down, but here's a, uh, here's a forder. So it's coming down a fairly steep slope. You can imagine that's getting close to well over 35 degrees. Can you guys see that video okay? Did it come across all right? Great. So you can see here, here's the winch assist. So there's actually, it's winch assisted. Here's the cable. And this in case the cable actually stopped it from sliding all the way down the hill. But remember the rule was you don't want your machine to be compromised. And in this case, when a machine is sliding down the hill like this, it definitely is compromised, okay? Just show you the video again. So he is an operator, and he's effectively, he or she, sorry, I can't see who the operator is, um, but what they're doing is effectively going onto a slope that exceeds the capability of the system, which is both the forder and its traction and the winch assist that's supporting it. So if you ever see a winch assist machine doing something like this, you have gone well and truly beyond where it's supposed to operate, okay? And you would have been able to predict that if you've done that calculation, if you've done that chart, you would have been able to see that on this soil that's obviously not that strong, given the tension capability of these European systems, which is not that high, it wasn't a suitable place for you to be operating. Okay, what I'm gonna leave you with at this point in time, I'll leave this one up, is we're gonna have this little break, but what I would like you to do is just do this practice calculation, 35 ton excavator on the 40 degree slope, and we've got a winch assist of four ton. So wet clay soil, traction coefficient is 40%. Should this machine be used, is it stable? So what you need to do is that traction plus the cable, if that number is greater than gravity, it's stable. If it's not, then it's not a stable system. Right. So with that, um, like I say, I'm going to have a little break. You've got a little break as well. 
I'm going to join you back at two o'clock. Have a break, do this calculation, and we'll start back up with session two, technical session two, uh, and we'll also check the answer of this particular scenario. All right? Any questions or comments on what we've covered at this point in time? Are we starting back at two or one? Sorry? Are we starting back at two o'clock or one o'clock? Oh, sorry, back at one o'clock. My apologies. It's one o'clock. Yes, so in 20 minutes' time, we'll start back at one o'clock. Yeah? Everybody good? So, sorry, I'll put the screen on share again, but otherwise, uh, have a little break, do the calculation, and I'll see you again in about 15 minutes, okay? Great. Thank you.